It'd be nice if you could catch code QC issues before they get pushed to GitHub. You're about to see how to do exactly that. Plus, after you've pushed to GitHub, how to automate the kinds of things that are important in a commercial grade production code project. Today, we're talking about GitHub Actions and pre-commit. This video refers to v0.6.3 of the repo, and I put a link in the description down below. Pre-commit is an extensible command line tool that runs just before git commit. If you're coding in a popular language, like JavaScript or Python, then there are lots of language-specific pre-commit hooks that you can add to your project. But even if you aren't, there are still a lot of important things that pre-commit hooks can look for in your project. The repo we're using today, link in the description down below, has around 8,500 lines of code written in various languages, and pre-commit runs 30 different kinds of checks on this code base before every commit. These cover everything from code syntax checking to code style, looking for unresolved merge conflicts, spell checking your comments. It can reformat your JSON and your YAML files, run a security analysis on your code, it can even validate your readme. It's a workhorse. It's a huge game changer that'll help you to take the quality of your code project to the next level. But once your quite clean commit makes it up into GitHub, well then there's GitHub Actions. If you're new to GitHub Actions, then you should check out my video, GitHub Pro Tips. We're going to see how to set up automated context-sensitive unit tests right now, and also how you can integrate these into automated pull requests and semantic release processes. Very cool. And actually, there are even more automation tricks inside of this repo, so stay to the end to see what these are. And for that matter, like and subscribe if you're into that kind of thing. I'm going to simulate a bug fix to some Python code, which will trigger the automated release workflows. We'll see pre-commit QC this code change. And then once we're past that, what's supposed to happen is that a couple of GitHub Actions workflows will automatically kick off that will evaluate the nature of the changes. And assuming that that goes well, then I'll open a PR, triggering even more GitHub Actions, which should detect the Python code in the commits, and then initiate Python-specific unit tests. Side note, there are different unit tests for each of the languages contained in this repo. If and when the PR is approved in merge domain, yet another automated process will analyze the commit comments to make a determination on whether a new semantic version should be released. It should. So it'll do that and then bump the Python package version number as well and add an entry to the change log and then we should be nearly done. Lastly, a final automated action will merge main back into all the dev branches so that these remain synced to main in order to avoid merge conflicts later from these branches. This being a public repo, all this stuff is publicly viewable from GitHub. So I'm going to put links in the description for the job runs, the commit, and the PR so that you can circle back and take a closer look at these on your own time at your own pace. But one thing that you should see first is how Git branches and merges are assumed to flow in order for these automated CI-CD processes to perform as I'm demonstrating to you. Suppose your repo only had a single branch named main and you do a single push and then create a release named v0.1.0. After that release, you do a second push and that's what we're looking at in the diagram right now. So just to be clear, Main is one commit ahead of the release, v0.1.0. Okay, so if you felt so compelled, you could create a new release consisting of the two commits. And that would look something like this. Okay, so far so good. Now, a more responsible strategy would be to create a new branch off of main. I'm calling this branch next, and that should make more sense momentarily. You do your stuff in next, and then meanwhile, there might be things happening simultaneously in main, like maintenance, like uh, bumping package versions and cleaning up your documentation and whatnot. Once you're satisfied with your work in next, you can merge it to main. But a better way to do that would be to create a pull request so that there's at least the option of adding a third-party code reviewer and an approval process, maybe some release notes, and maybe even a discussion thread to provide a forum for others to weigh in on the specifics of the commits. That's what we're about to do in this live demo. Plus, we'll automate the package release in GitHub. Now then, if we can automate all that stuff with a single branch called next, well then by extension, we can do the same thing with any branch where all the other branches lead to next and next leads to main. Last thing, a pro tip. It's really helpful to sync the dev branches from main. 
You do that in order to avoid merge conflicts in subsequent iterations. GitHub Actions are written in YAML, and they're intuitive and easy to read. Also, be aware that GitHub Actions is basically a free service as long as you don't abuse it. There's just a couple of things I want to bring to your attention about the actions themselves. Nearly all the salient code is located in .github. Anything else that might matter is compulsorily located inside of the root of the repo. Workflows can run in any of several popular operating environments. I always use Ubuntu Latest because I'm familiar with it and because it generally matches up with most of my production stuff, but there are lots of other options. Every time your workflow is instantiated, it's running on a brand new, pristine operating environment, and so you have to install and configure everything that your workflow needs. GitHub Actions workflows can be triggered many different ways, and you can fine-tune these in a lot of cases. This workflow is triggered on certain kinds of pull request actions and only if certain kinds of files are included in the commits. You can save your API credentials, your AWS CLI key pair, GitHub personal access token, and so on inside of GitHub Secrets, and then these become accessible to your workflows. Some of the workflow steps call actions, which are either published to the marketplace or they're coded locally inside of this repo. They both work the same way. Look in .github slash actions for examples. You can do anything in a job or an action that you can do on the command line on your dev machine. There literally are no limitations nor caveats beyond those of the CPU and memory resources that are allocated to the job itself. GitHub Copilot is enormously helpful for scaffolding workflows. It's another big game changer, so if you don't have it already, you might consider getting it. Mind you, there are details you have to tend to to make this work well. The root of this repo contains a dozen configuration files, all of which bear on the behavior of these automated processes in one way or another. But dude, look, seriously, if you're watching this video, I mean, if you made it this far into this video, then you've definitely got what it takes to figure out the rest of this stuff on your own. Just Clone the repo, link down below, get it opened up in your code editor, and take a closer look. There's one other thing we really have to talk about today. That's Dependabot. Acquired by GitHub in 2019, Dependabot is a tool integrated into GitHub that helps to keep your dependencies up to date. It does this by automatically opening pull requests in your repository to update outdated dependencies to their latest versions as it finds them. This project has dependencies for NPM, PyPI, and Terraform. And all of these are monitored and maintained by Dependabot. It sends you emails as it does stuff, so you get pretty granular, blow-by-blow, real-time updates as it does its work. That's the big stuff that's being automated in this repo. I'll do more videos for these at some point in the future, so leave a comment down below if there's something in particular you'd like me to cover. But for now, that's it, and I will see you in the next video.